we are starting a series. We've already into it. This is the third part of the series that we've been talking about, about God's heart. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about a heart to honor authority. And if you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 24. During <laughs> my life, I've had a little problem with authority throughout my career. I've lost a job or two just because I had to work with somebody that was completely an idiot. <laughs> And it wasn't my fault. And again, I know teaching school, there's been many, many, many times I just had to bite my tongue and just go with it. And sometimes you wonder, even with children, when did these cute, beautiful little angels all of a sudden begin to question everything and become these little defiant monsters that they become? I don't understand where that happens. As I look at my own family history, the high streets, I've noticed as I looked at my grandfather and his brothers, all worked for themselves. My grandpa, H.J., sold real estate in Algonac. Tom, his brother, was a plumber here in Algonac. Bill sold used cars. Carl was the mechanic over there at his house. Andrew was, again, my farmer over there on High Road. Even my dad and Kevin's dad, my dad's brother, they sold real estate. And so I come from a long line of people that just could not work for somebody. And they had to work for themselves. And they struggled with authority. And one thing, though, they did not struggle with was being authoritative. You know, you can ask Kevin or my brother and some of the things that we had to go through growing up. I mean, we just couldn't pull grass. There had to be a special way. <laughs> you see right there, two fingers, catch and pull. Had to be done a special way. I love the story Kevin will tell you, that he had those old push lawnmowers, and he was tired of cutting his grass that way, so he raised his own and bought himself a used regular gas-powered lawnmower. When he came home one day, the old one was sitting in the yard. His dad gave away the lawnmower. He said, no, no, we don't cut the grass that way. I don't know how many times <laughs> I was just given to somebody because they might need the grass cut or they need these things. And you just say, John, go do this. And I've learned a lot of different jobs from honey dipping. I don't know if you know what honey dipping is. <laughs> where so-and-so, they need their sewers cleaned out. Can you go away? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and so we learn these things about authority. And so one of the things that I know with Uncle Don and with my dad, it was a respect for the elder. You know, when they're older, you refer to them as Mr. and Mrs. Or was yes, sir, or no, ma'am. And that was very, very important to them. And it seems like in today's society, we've kind of missed that. We see a complete lack of respect going on. So many of these kids think that they're entitled to everything. That's been the hardest part as, as a coach, is I've gone through the years that these kids just feel they don't have to work hard, they should be able to play. They're just entitled to these things. Going back when I was teaching at plantations, kind of goes on both ends of the story here today, was before cell phones, and kids had cell phones, I remember going into the office where peep kids were making phone calls after school. And at plantation, we went from extreme, very, very wealthy people to we were busing people in from very terrible areas. And so here's this little princess, little white girl, couldn't have been more this big, just cute as could be, and she's yelling on the phone, you're so stupid. How many times have I reminded you? I can't believe it. And she's going on, and so she hangs up, bam. And I went, whoa, who are you talking to? My mother. And I went, whoa. <laughs> whoa, complete lack of authority, it's respect. But four or five days later, I walk in the office, and there's this black kid, about six foot five, but 245, played on the football team, I think he was all everything, and he's on the phone, and, he, <laughs> and he's going, um, Mom, I 
forgot my, my cleats. No, no, I, I know. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll play barefoot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I will walk home. I, I, no, 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 three miles is okay. <laughs> and I go, whoa, <laughs> difference. There was some respect there. I like the story also of a department head aboard a Navy vessel who became concerned about one of his senior enlisted men. And this is a true story. And this enlisted man was probably one of the best technicians that they had. But he had a problem showing respect to these commanding officers. And so this man says, here, let me just give you a little bit of advice. I see you're having a hard time with those above you. He said, when any time an officer gives you a directive, just smile and just say, yes, sir. No matter how stupid the directive is, just smile and say, yes, sir. Even though in the back of your mind you're going, what an idiot, just smile and say, yes, sir. And he said, do you think this will work for you, soldier? And he smiled and went, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, that enlistment had a problem a little bit. And in the military, there's really not a lot of room for being rebellious. In the military, you follow orders or you suffer the consequences. Rebellion is not accepted in the military. And it's not accepted by God either. God tells us that there are consequences if you have a rebellious attitude. In Psalm 68, 6 it said, God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Repeatedly, we see this through the scriptures, how God responds to people and how we need to respond to those in authority over us. Paul writes in Romans 13, 1, 2, we've read this already today, let everyone be subjected to the governed authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Submit yourself to government or governing authorities. Do we really have to? Do we really have to? Now, oh, it's easy if you agree with them. <laughs> if they make decisions that are right and moral and fair, it's no problem. I can do this. But what if these government authorities aren't really good people? What if they make decisions that you don't agree with? What if they're not righteous or moral or fair? What if they're just mean and spiteful and dangerous? What if they're like King Saul in the story we're going to read today? King Saul was not a very good man. He'd been disobedient to God, and because of his disobedience, he has been plagued by an evil spirit. When Saul realized that people loved David a lot more than him and were singing praises to him, Saul tried to kill him. And when David finally fled Saul's presence, and David was running, he stopped at a tabernacle. And Himlech was the priest, and he took David in, and he fed David and all his men, and offered them a place to rest. When Saul found out about this, this is what he did. He had them all ordered killed. You helped David. Therefore, I'm going to kill you all. So he killed the priest. He killed the high priest. And so here comes the question. How do you honor a government authority like that? How do you submit to something that wicked and that terrible? How do you obey someone who considers you an enemy and wants you dead? That's the question 
that David had to face. Remember when World War I first broke out, the war ministry in London telegraphed a coded message to one of the British outposts in Africa. And this is what the message said. War is declared. Arrest all enemy aliens in your district. The war minister received this reply back. He said, we've arrested 10 Germans, 6 Belgians, 4 Frenchmen, 2 Italians, 3 Australians, and an American. Please advise immediately who are we at war with. <laughs> and sometimes we don't know. But in this case, they knew. The war here now is between two forces. That of King David, not King David, King Saul, and David. Saul is one of those enemies that just won't give up. He almost gets David. If we go back to chapter 22, we almost, he almost gets David. But Saul's empire here, his kingdom is being attacked by the Philistines, and so he has to go back home, protect. And as soon as that threat was over, he regroups to pursue David. And because of his repeated attempts on his life, David is now trying to flee and stay ahead of King Saul. And for months, we see that David is going throughout the wilderness trying to stay ahead of King Saul. Even to a point where others in the areas heard this is what David was doing, and about 600 other warriors joined David as he's fleeing. Now Saul is going to track him down. He finds where he is in a place called En Gedi, which means rocks of the wild goat. So you can kind of get an idea what this place looks. It kind of helped you a little bit. So you can see what the terrain looks like, all these different caves and stuff. And David is now hiding. Now prepare yourself for this part of the story because it gets just a little graphic here. But I like how God tells it because he's going to tell it like it is. And so I'm going to do the same. See, Saul and his men arrive at this place like this. And Saul has to stop. And the question is, why did Saul have to stop? Well, the King James Version says he had to cover his feet. The New King, King James Version says, attend to his needs. I like what the NIV says, he went there to relieve himself. Now, whatever the case may be, all these are just a polite way to say the man had to go to the bathroom. And since they didn't have like porta potties or little rest areas all over the place, a cave was as good as any. I remember reading a, a story of a proper English school teacher who was leaving England and going to Switzerland. And so she goes there to find an apartment. And she stays there for a day or two, finds one, and goes back. And then she writes to the man who was helping her because she realized. I didn't see a bathroom. So I don't know if it's down the hall. I don't know. And being proper, she didn't want to use the word bathroom. So as she wrote in the letter, she used proper English, water closet, which means bathroom. But she didn't want to write the word water closet, so she just put WC. She said, when I was there, I did not see where the WC is. Can you please help and inform me? Well, this guy from Switzerland reads it, and he has no clue what WC means. And so he goes to a local priest and says, maybe you can help me on this one. And he looks at it and he says, oh, I know what that means. It means wayside chapel. And so he writes this woman back, and this is the letter he writes. He says, dear madam, the WC is located nine miles from the house. <laughs> It is found in a heart of a beautiful grove of trees. It will seat 150 people at one time. <laughs> it is open only on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Some people bring their lunch and make a day of it. <laughs> on Thursdays, there is an organ accompaniment. The acoustics are wonderful. The slightest sound can be heard by everyone. It may interest you to know that my daughter met her husband at the WC. <laughs> we are now in the process of taking donations to purchase plush seats. 
We feel that is a long felt need as the present seats have a hole in them. <laughs> My wife, being rather delicate, hasn't been able to attend regularly. It's been six months since she went last. Naturally, it pains her not to be able to go there more often. I will close now with the desire to accommodate you in every way possible, and we'll be happy to save you a seat either down in front or near the door as you prefer. So, sometimes, and I love how the Bible, they try to go around, but God says, really, if you look at it, Saul was going to this cave because he had to go to the bathroom. And so as he's in this cave doing his business, he's distracted. And so, of course, we don't know how he lifted his robe or put his robe to the side. We find out that David and his men are already in that cave, just out of sight in the darkness. Nonetheless, David, David's men sees this as an opportunity. And they go, here's your chance. He's by himself. He's doing his business. This would be a perfect time to go kill Saul. And by killing Saul, this will alleviate all your problems, and now you can claim the throne for yourself. Meaning the throne. <laughs> there you go. Good. All right. <laughs> I wanted to make sure everybody got that straight. <laughs> now, do you get this mental picture of what's going on? King Saul is going to the bathroom, surrounding the darkness now by his enemies. And so, let's just say that this is not a real good position for Saul to be in. Now, David's men basically see this as an opportunity. But David so quietly sneaks behind Saul, who's completely unaware. And David takes out his knife, and he cuts off a corner of the king's robe. But he doesn't kill Saul. As he goes back, his men are going, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. You had this opportunity? Are you kidding me? Give us that chance, and we'll take care of King Saul. But David feels guilty even for cutting off a piece of the king's robe. He says, this man is God's chosen king. Nobody has a right to disgrace him, much less kill him. Nobody has a right to touch the king. And David rebukes his men with these words. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is anointed by the Lord. You see, David shows mercy to Saul. Not for Saul's sake. For God's sake. David defeats his enemy not through murder. He defeats him through mercy even though he knew if the tide was turned and Saul had that opportunity, he would have killed David. But it just shows the difference between a person who has God's own heart and a man who's turned his back on God. So who won the battle? David, because he obeyed God. He honored his authority and did not violate his own conscience because he knew what God wanted. There's a true story during the Revolutionary War. There was a Baptist minister who lived in a small town in Pennsylvania named Peter Miller, who was a very, very close friend at the time to George Washington. In that same town lived a man named Michael Whitman. Michael Whitman was a man of authority in this town, but he was a very evil man. And he did not like this minister and gave him as much trouble as he could. Made life terrible for this minister. One day, this Michael Whitman was caught in a plot to go against the colonial army. And he was arrested and he was sentenced to be executed. When this old preacher heard about this, he started on on foot and walked 70 miles to Philadelphia to plead for this man's life. When he told George Washington, please, spare his life, Washington says, I'm sorry, Peter, I cannot grant you the life 
of your good friend. And the preacher looked at Wash and he says, he is not my friend. He is a, one of my bitterest enemies that I have. And Washington looked and said, you walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts everything in a whole different light. And George Washington granted the pardon. And Peter Miller took Michael Whitman from that very shadow of death back to the little town, no longer as enemies, but as a friend. So the question today is, how does God desire us to deal with those in authority? Well, we know that David was a man after God's own heart. If we want to know how we submit to these authorities, then we need to have David, David as an example. Because how did David submit to King Saul? You know, as I was studying this, I came up with four obvious ways that David did this. The first, David made every effort to communicate with King Saul. After Saul had left the cave and began to lead the area, David went out from the cave as well, and he called out to Saul. David is now trying to make every effort to try to work out these problems. And everybody knows sometimes it's very, very difficult to communicate to those in authority. Sometimes we have a hard time just communicating with each other. There's that story of a husband and wife who are having a hard time communicating with each other. And he decided the problem was she's hard of hearing. That's why we're having problems. And so one day he said, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to test it and just see. So one day he walks in and he's in the living room and he sees that she's off in the corner reading and her back's towards him. And so he walks in and goes, can you hear me? Nothing. So he gets a little closer. Can you hear me now? Nothing. Gets even a little closer. Can you hear me? Nothing. He gets right behind her and says, can you hear me? And she wheels around, mad as a, this is all can be, and says, for the fourth time, yes! <laughs> one of the things that often keeps people at odds with one another is that lack of communication. We see disagreements escalate into feuds all because people refuse to talk about their problems or talk to one another. I always call this sometimes this knee-jerk reaction. You see it happen. You hear something or they said and boom, you make a quick decision on how you want to handle this situation. But David teaches us that if you want to honor authority, you must make every effort to try to communicate with them. No sooner does Saul come out from the outhouse that David takes his life into his own hands? He knows he's putting his own life into his own hands. And he calls out to Saul, reaching out to communicate with the king, the very king that wants him dead. So how does he do this? How does David communicate with Saul? First of all, he communicates humbly. David bows to the ground before Saul, not in worship, but in humility. He wants Saul to see that he respects the authority of God, that he is God's anointed king, and he has no desire to fight him or go against him. And he says to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you've been seeing with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in that cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. And so first, he communicates with you, excuse me, humility. Second, he communicates tactfully. When David showed Saul the corner of the robe he cut, he discreetly reminds the king that he does not want to fight, even if Saul wants to. David just gently reminds Saul who is hunting who. 
and how David is trusting God to save him from the king's clutches. David speaks the truth to Saul, presenting his innocence and trying to appeal to Saul's sense of justice and find a way, how can we end this conflict? David, he communicates sincerely. David is just not trying to pull one over on his enemy. He truly is sincere. He wants Saul to know that he has nothing to fear from him, even though he has done nothing, nothing to him. David is trying to give out, and he's being so sincere that I will not repay evil with evil. And how many times that's a first thought in our minds. They did something wrong. I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll show them. And David is speaking from his heart because he doesn't want to be at war with Saul. He's trying to defeat his enemy by talking to him from his heart. By showing a respect of authority. Second, David's submission to King Saul did not include giving the king what he wanted. Saul wanted David dead. Simple as that. But David didn't comply. He didn't allow King Saul to take his life. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. What does this mean to submit? And once it became apparent that Saul's home, where David was living, wasn't safe, David didn't stay there because he was going to, well, the king wants me here and the king wants me dead. I guess I've got to submit to that and let him kill me. We've got to be very careful on this because David refused to stay there. So many times through my psych class and talking to a lot of people, I've been asked if a woman should live in a house where her husband abuses her. And you really look at the Bible, it really doesn't address this, but David's situation here tells me that God's people are not required to remain in a dangerous and life-threatening situation. If a woman's life is in danger, if she's being abused, she needs to leave. It's simple as that. Scripture does not require that a woman live in that kind of a situation. And this church and the members of this church will not allow that and will help them in any way. And we have to understand this. Submitting to those in authority does not mean that you're always giving to what they want. If what a person in authority wants is immoral, if what they want is illegal, or just plain wrong, we're not obligated to obey them in those matters. In the New Testament, we read of the time Peter and John were arrested, and now they're brought before the Sanhedrin. These rulers of Israel sternly commanded the apostles, do not speak at all in the name of Jesus. But I like what Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to God? You be the judges. For us, we cannot help speak about what we have seen and what we've heard. They're going to speak the truth. They're willing to face any kind of consequences of their decision. However, submission to earthly authority was overridden by their submission to the will of God. The apostles respected their elders, their rulers, but they would not disobey God. Which brings us to our third point. David's submission to the king was based on respect of the office. When David addressed the king, he called him my father. He called him my master. He called him my Lord's anointed. There were no insults. There were no put-downs. There was no name-calling. And sometimes it's easy to do when you're mad at somebody. Why was David so respectful of this evil and spiteful king? Because David was a man after God's own heart. David had meditated on the law. David knew the law. And he knew what the law commanded him to do. In Exodus 22:28, it says, Do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. Going back a little bit, some years, I don't know if you remember this, there was a major, Harold Campbell, who gave a speech in the Netherlands. And it was at a banquet for U.S. Air personnel. In his speech, President Clinton was in office, and he called 
President Clinton in his speech nothing but a pot-smoking, draft-dodging, womanizing commander-in-chief. Now, I don't know if anybody remembered what happened to the general. He was given early retirement. <laughs> in other words, he got fired. And that's exactly what he deserved. Whether that general was correct in his accusations or not is not relevant. You do not badmouth those who are ruling you. The military won't honor such behavior, and God won't either. In the book of Acts, we're told the time Paul stood before the Sanhedrin, and Ananias, the high priest, ordered him again to be slapped. Why? Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this time, the high priest and it ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. S slap him! Slap that man! And Paul was shocked, stunned. He said, God will strike you, you white, I love that, you whitewashed walls. You sit there to judge me according to law, yet yourselves violate the law by commanding that I be struck? Are you kidding me? And all of a sudden, Somebody says, well, wait a minute here. Those who are standing here, Paul said, how dare you insult the high priest? How dare you? And all of a sudden, Paul realizes and says this. I didn't realize that it was the high priest that gave that order. And he goes on to say, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. He apologizes. I am so sorry. I mean, he had every right when he first got struck. They just couldn't order it, but the high priest could. He didn't know that's who gave the order, and he was mad. But once he learned that it was the high priest that gave the order, hey, I'm sorry. This is my fault. And so we find out that submitting to those in authority over us does not require us that we give them everything they ask. If they're requesting something that is immoral, illegal, or wrong, but it does require us to speak respectful to them. We're not allowed to curse them. It's not our job to insult them. And it's not our job to belittle them. The fourth, submission to those in authority means that we must determine not to hurt them. David declared to Saul, may the Lord judge between you and me and may the Lord avenge your wrongs you've done to me, but my hand will not touch you. That's God's job. That's not my job. And we have to understand, that's not my job. That is now God's job to handle that. There's a story of a young man who worked in a factory. And the supervisor was very arrogant, very mean, very pushy. And he just loved having that kind of authority. And it really seemed like nobody liked this man, including this young man thought. He was just awful. But he never said anything bad about him. And one day, the supervisor came walking through this man's department and noticed there was a can of parts laying on the floor next to the machine. And the supervisor told him, get rid of those. I don't want these around here. It looks messy. Get rid of those parts right now. And the young man says, excuse me, sir. You really don't want me to do that. These are very valuable parts. And the supervisor, in just a flash of anger, said, you better get rid of those now or you can go find yourself another job. And so the young man picked up all those parts, put them in a big can, and for a moment as he's walking out to the back where the trash pile was, he just felt like, I'm just going to start flinging these everywhere. I'll show, him who's, well, I'll show him who's running this company. But he didn't. He just took them and put them off to the side. Well, a few days later, the plant was visited by the owners of the company. And as they walked through the factory, he noticed that they didn't look real happy. And the supervisor very frantically approached the young man and says, come here, I need to talk to you for a minute. He says, uh, where are those parts? <laughs> They're looking for those parts. Did you throw them away? And all of a sudden, the supervisor realized these parts, like the man said, were very, very important. And so the young man walked out to the garbage heap, found where he put them off to the side, walked back in and gave them to the supervisor, which saved his job. Now, I don't know if this young man was a Christian or not. I don't know. But what he did was right. He had, a, he had an opportunity to embarrass 
and hurt and get this man of authority fired if he wanted to. A man that nobody respected, but he refused to take that opportunity to do so. In essence, this young man had declared, my hand will not touch you. That's God's job. That's God's job. Instead of hurting the man, he saved this man's position, and he saved this man's reputation. As we call up our singers. In the Old Testament, David is our model of who we need to follow. He gives us a perfect example of how we need to respect authority. He was a man after God's own heart. And his behavior in situations like this one tells us how can we please God in our actions? How can we please God when we're dealing with some people that it's very, very difficult to deal with? But Jesus is our model in the New Testament. That's who we look at. And the question is, do you think Jesus ever had any problem with authority? <laughs> Did Jesus have any problem with authority? I like what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2. And he said, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to be the emperor or the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Who judges justly. How could Jesus endure the horrors of the cross when he knew he did no wrong. How do you endure the insults, the pain, the beatings? Because he trusted himself to him who judges justly. He trusted in him, God, who judges justly. Exactly what David did. As we read again, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you've done, but not my hand will touch you. It's not our job. That's what makes a difference between us, between us and those who work and the people we work with who don't entrust themselves to God. They don't trust God. And we deal with this all the time. It'd be nice if we could be around people who trust in God and who believe in God and put God first. Around. It would be a wonderful world out there, but it's not. It's not. Those who don't trust God follow their own insights. Those who don't trust in God follow their own guidance rather than submit themselves over to God. As a result, sometimes a workplace can be a place of anger and frustration and conflict. Sometimes even a home. But when we look to God and wait for His intervention, we know that his peace will come over us. That he is in control. Judy says this all the time on our Wednesday Bible studies. He says, there's a lot of things I don't understand, but I know God's in control. And that's good enough for me. I know that God is in control. And I love that when she says that. I know it's not easy to live under the authority of some people who really aren't that smart, who really aren't that righteous, who really aren't good people. But when I've applied these examples of David, when I apply the examples of Jesus Christ to those situations, God showed himself faithful and in time 
help me deal with these kind of situations the way God wants us to deal with these situations. That's what we see happen in David's life. It was just what we see happen for us when Jesus entrusts himself to the one who judges justly. Peter continues and he says, He himself bore our sins in the body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see, the danger of living on the defensive is that we become very belligerent and we stop honoring authority. If we think of ourselves as constantly being threatened by others, especially those in authority, we can very easily come to think of people as our enemies and we feel anger and hatred towards them. Peter, who wrote this, went through that same, same problem that we go through. As you remember, on that night that Jesus was arrested, the soldiers come marching in as they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there they are. These were the authorities sent to go pick up Jesus. Peter, now overwhelmed by the odds against him, angry at the injustice. This is not fair. This man has done nothing. And now he is angry. And he grabs a sword and he swings it and he cuts a man's ear off. But Jesus held Peter's belligerent at bay. The damage to that ear was miraculously healed. And so Peter, learning this lesson, he wrote, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you you're living the way you are and always with the utmost courtesy and always with respect we don't have to go out there and start cutting ears off we don't need to be out there swinging swords at everyone we don't have to show that anger instead what you have to do is give a defense out of courtesy to talk with a calm heart to approach him with a heart after God to honor that authority. I want to close with a story. Hundreds and hundreds of units in ancient Japan. And there was a monk sitting on the side of the road meditating. And the samurai warrior comes walking by. And he kicks the monk. I got a question for you. What is the difference between heaven and hell? And the monk sat there quietly smile came on his face and he looked up to him he says you can ask me that question you who's filthy you whose breath stinks you look at me you haven't washed in days you who seem to be ignorant of all things you are going to ask me this question and the samurai wore his eyes bugged the vein stuck on and he says oh you do you know who I am do you know the authority that I have you that's it you're a dead man as he takes his sword and is he about to cut this monk's head off the monk looked at him and goes that's hell the way you're thinking that's hell and the samurai said are you kidding me and tears came into his eyes he goes you risked your life to teach me this lesson? And his tears flowed down from his face. He said, I am so grateful to you. I am so honored that you taught me this lesson. Thank you. And with that, the monk looked at him and said, that's heaven. That's heaven. We have a choice to make. It's up to us. We can live like it's hell, or we can put in our hearts God wants in our hearts to be a man, a woman, a student after God's own heart. We have to make that decision. It's a commitment that we need to make as Christians to understand of who we are and what we want. We have to make the decision that this is what I need to be. I need to put my hands into God's hands. My life needs to be controlled by who He is and what He can do for me. 
because these people on earth cannot do anything. I fear no one. But we have to make a commitment. If you're not a Christian, this is a life that Jesus has come. It's going to be so much better. If you're struggling with things, there's people here that will pray with you and talk with you. But it's a choice that you have to make. Let's go to Lord in prayer.